PowerPoint presentation is going to focus on the pair t-test. Now, the pair t-test has its basis or origins in something similar to the two sample t-test, although slightly different in its analysis. It is uh, attempting to look at two means and see what goes on. So we've also looked at the one sample t-test and the two sample, and now we're going to We are still interested in comparing two means similar to the two sample. So we're interested in whether there's any difference between the averages for uh, two particular things. So consider an example where we're parallel parking cars. So we have a car A and a car B. And interest lies in the time it takes for us to parallel park these two similar cars, okay, similar brands of cars. So we're going to measure the time. So ideally we're looking for what is one of them much lower in terms of the time it takes to parallel park the car. There are essentially two different, probably practical approaches for collecting the data. And they lead to different analysis. So it's very important to understand that tie between how we collect the data refers or uh, dictates how we're going to analyze the data. This is extremely important in, in things like this, especially in the pair t-test and the two sample t-test, because many people are going to use software at some point to actually analyze this data. Now the software in general will let you analyze the data under the paired menu or the two sample menu as long as you have equal sample sizes. So therefore, there's really, it's not going to know, the software doesn't know which way you collected the data. You're clicking one button, it's going to do that particular, that particular program. So it is important to understand the difference. So let's start with, there are 20 people available to park the cars. All right, and so the question is, how are we going to use these 20 people? Well, one approach would be to take 10 of those at random and assign them to car A. And whatever ones are left over, they're going to park car B. Okay? Collect the data. We've got a column for A, a column for B. We can get the two means, right? The two sample means and use those to perform some sort of test. One problem with this particular thing, method of doing it this way, is what happens if just by chance most of the good drivers end up in car A, and most of the bad drivers, and just in terms of parallel parking, end up in car B. Well, in that case, the car A average will probably be much lower than the car B average because we've got all the more or most of the good drivers on car A. So their times are all low. Okay? Notice if they had parked car B, they probably also would have been low. But because they only parked car A and we got most of the good people, we would probably end up stating that car A is better than car B. Now that's not clear because we don't really know if it's the car or if it is the drivers. And that is a problem. So an alternative would be why don't we have all 20 people park both cars? Okay? So we have every single person, they park A and they park B. This way, if they're a good driver and they have very low numbers for parking, then both their A and B car will be low. And then, if they're a bad driver, somebody's a bad driver, then both of them will be high. So they'll be affecting both A and B by their driving ability. This way, we'll feel more confident in when we, when we go to analyze the data that we're not so concerned about the drivers that we can focus just on what's the impact of the car. So the diff real difference between this is that if each person only parks one car, so that was the first scenario, 10 people park A, the other 10 people park B. Their recorded time is independent of the other drivers. So let's suppose I park, I'm the first person to go and I park car A. I'm independent of every other driver, not only the nine other people who park car A, but also all 10 people who park car B, or other, in other words, all 19 other drivers 
my well, my answer is independent. Whatever took me to park has no impact on anybody else. The appropriate analysis is a two sample t test. Okay, we have people who parked A, we have people who parked B. So we have a random sample from A, a random sample from B, and we're comparing the two means. However, if each person parks both cars, then their time on each car is correlated. So for example, let's suppose I'm first again. I park car A in, let's say, 18 seconds. It is very unlikely that I'm going to turn around and park car B in, say, 50 seconds. Okay? So my other number will be in some small neighborhood around 18. So therefore, knowing my first number gives you a good idea of what my second number is. Therefore, those data points are correlated. Okay? All right? Now, I am still independent, though, of the other 19 drivers, right? My two times, while they're, the two individual times are correlated with each other, they have nothing to do with what the next person's two times are, or the next person's two times, and so on. Okay? So the drivers are still independent of each other, but the two observations within a driver are not independent. The appropriate analysis of this is the pair t-test. This is what we're going to focus on. Okay? The key is whether one observation is taken on a unit, a person here, or there are two observations. If there is only one observation taken on a unit, then that is the two sample t-test. And if there are two taken on the same unit, meaning they're correlated as we talked about, then that's the paired t-test. The advantage of a paired t-test is when we expect the drivers to be very different from each other, then we don't want the driver to driver to have any impact on the analysis of the two cars. So when we expect them to be very different, then I would want to pair them so that I don't have to worry about all the good drivers ending up on A or all the bad drivers on B. This way, if they're good, they're both good, both parking A and B, and if they're bad, both their times will be bad. Okay? And that's okay. The classic example of a paired t-test is a before and after scenario. So, for example, suppose we do a human resources survey within our company and we're interested in, um, you know, benefits and job stress and things like that. And then we take some things away maybe, or maybe we don't at all, and again in three months we do another survey and we want to know if there was any change in the beliefs of things that happened between that time period. So, something before and after. Another example would be, let's say, a pre-test and a post-test, another example. Well, if I use the same people in both surveys, so I take a sample of, say, 50 people from my company. Three months later, I take the same 50 people and give them the survey again. Well, then they're paired because they, whatever their feelings were before will have some impact on what their feelings are now. But how they were feeling the first time is not the same as, say, how the guy next to them might have felt. So therefore, if we use different people, there would not be any correlation between what say Frank felt the first time the survey was done, and three months later we interviewed Joe, what Joe's thinking does not necessarily correlate with what Frank was thinking three months ago. So therefore that would be an independent scenario and you'd use a two-sample t-test. So not all before and after tests are necessarily paired, even though it is the classic example. The pairing again means that it must be on the same physical unit. So let's return to our parallel parking example and follow that all the way through our five-step procedure for the hypothesis test, as well as a confidence interval. So the question is, how should we carry out the experiment in general? We've decided that each person is going to park both cars. We have 20 people, and each person is going to park both cars. But there are some other questions of interest. For example, should all the drivers be of similar ability? So should we have everybody that would give us all roughly 20s or all roughly 40s, or should there be a wide range of that? Well, the answer to that, of course, is no. The driver should not be of the same ability uh, because what is the focus? The focus is to sell the car to everybody. So if we're sell trying to sell the car to everybody, then we should have some good drivers and some bad drivers and some medium drivers because that reflects reality of who's going to buy the car. Plus, the advantage of doing the pair 
IRG test, as I mentioned earlier, is that the wider the range of the driver ability, then the bigger advantage to doing a pair T test. If the drivers are all very similar, then we can then it doesn't matter when we randomize 10 to sample 10 to car A and 10 to car B. It's not really going to matter who goes where because they're all similar abilities. So in that case, we could do a two sample T test if we were could, were assured that they were basically the same ability. Should every person park car A first and then car B second? That's how my little picture was. I didn't do anything different when I showed the original setup. I had all the A's in row one and all the B's in row two. Well, the answer to this, of course, is no as well, right? Because in general, we, we would not want to do that because of some, maybe some time effect. Here, we're, we're worried about learned effect, especially. If I get in and park the car, A, and, and I and I know I, well, I cut it a little sharp or I took it a little wide, so it took me a few extra seconds to get in because I had to adjust to that. Well, when I get in park the second car, right, I'm going to be able to help correct from that because I'm going to learn from my per first mistake. So therefore, that's going to make car B, if I do B second, a little bit lower probably, regardless of whether the handling ability, just correcting my own mistake. So we want to make sure we don't do that. So we want to randomize so that some people that learned effect is going to make B look better, and for some people it's going to make A. So we still want to probably take half the people at random and have them do A first, and half the people uh, do B first. Should we alternate drivers on each observation? So again, two classic ways you would carry this out. If I'm driver one, I park car A, and then I park car B. Then driver two comes, and then I go back to work or wherever I'm going. Person two comes up, maybe they do B first and A second, and then they leave. Or I could park car A and then go sit down for a while, and somebody else parks car B, and somebody else parks B, and somebody else parks A, and so on. And then later I come back up and park my other car, whatever the second one is for me and the second one for each person. Should we do that? Well, from a pure randomization point of view and statistical point of view, yes, because, again, we're putting more time to get rid of that learned effect in there so that we get a better idea of just the car and, and get rid of that learned effect. Now, it's not as important as step two because step two is going to balance that learned effect out half the time on A and half on B. So if, if we can't do that, uh, uh, we may do scenario one, which is you get a person a way to do the, to do the test, you have them do both and go back to work. So in general, yes, but not as important as, as step two there. All right, so the data. Let's suppose that the data comes out to be this. So we've got your drivers 1 to 20, 10 of them part A first, 10 of them part B. You'll see uh, some 18s and some 45s and 46s and a whole bunch of 20s and 30s in between. So we do have kind of a wide range of drivers bouncing around, and so we're interested in what, how to conduct this test once we have this data. Oh, so the general procedure is to take the difference between the two measurements. So we have that table there. So for each row, we take the difference between the two measurements. It doesn't matter whether they part A first or B first. We take the difference between them. This gives us an estimate of the car effect. Okay. So if they took 18 seconds on A and 20 seconds on B, then the effect of the car for that particular driver was that B was worse by two seconds, took them two seconds longer. Notice that if somebody else was a 46 on A and a 48 on B, then the effect of B is identical. It, it took two extra seconds to part B, regardless if they started in the 40s and the other person started in the 18s. This is what we're interested in. We're interested in the car effect, not the driver effect. So by taking that difference, we're removing that driver to driver variation out of the analysis, and we're just focusing on that column of differences which allows us to just look at the cars. So if there's really no difference, right, nothing going on at all with the cars, then the average of that column of 20 differences after we subtract, right, should be near zero. There should be some positives, which means sometimes A was better, and there should be some negatives, sometimes B was better. There should be no, nothing that really tells us anything at all, right? So they sort of cancel out, and we should get roughly zero. So the null hypothesis is that we're basically looking at this versus zero. 
So notice that this is very similar. After we subtract, we only have one column of numbers, the differences. So if I'm looking at that relative to a fixed target, target being zero in this example, means that this is very similar to a one-sample t-test, and in fact, reduces exactly to a one-sample t-test. So if I do the subtraction, I could then just perform a one-sample t-test on the differences with the target value being zero. So the null hypothesis would be, again, though, that the two means, car A and car B, are identical, which, as we've seen from the two-sample t-test, means we can write it as equal, or we can do a subtraction and write it equal to zero, which allows us to use some sort of confidence interval idea and check if zero is in our confidence. Again, it does not matter whether you do A minus B or B minus A. So let's let mu diff, okay, standing for the mean of the difference column, okay, the true mean of the differences in general, but differences in our column for, for the sample. So let mu diff, diff represent the true mean difference between the two means if we looked at everybody. All right? Then we can just simply replace mu a minus mu b with mu diff and write it as mu diff equals zero, which now you can see has the same general form as a one sample t test. It's just a mu equals some target value. I'm just putting specifically a diff on there to represent the differences and the target value is specifically zero. Notice that this is a two-sided case, not equal to. We could also look at one-sided cases, no problem. If I was just trying to prove A was better than B or B was better than A, we could simply do a greater than or less than test, not a problem at all. So what's our test statistic then? Well, we need an estimator for mu diff, okay? Well, the, the, the sample mean of the differences, so we have those 20 differences sitting there, right? Well, we subtracted them all. Well, the mean of that, that y bar, which we could just call y bar diff, right? That makes sense logically, right, to be the estimator uh, for mu diff, okay? So this is equivalent because means are linear. We can subtract first and then find y bar diff, or you could just find the two y bars separately and then subtract them. But typically we just refer to it as y bar diff. So our estimate variation then comes from the standard deviation of those differences, right? Again, it's like a one sample t-test. We only have one standard deviation because we have one column of differences. So again, I'll just refer to that as s diff, but it, it represents the same kind of standard deviation as a one sample. So our test statistic is identical to the one sample t, it's y bar diff minus our target value, and our target value is specifically zero here, divided by s diff over the square root of n. So it's identical to a one sample t test. Recall that, that I keep referring to these t ratios as distance over variation. The further that y bar diff in either the positive or negative direction, the further away it is from zero, there's some indication then that one of the cars is performing different than the other. However, before we can quantify whether that distance is large, we need to know where it is in within the curve, so we need to know where it is relative to the variation of the data. So always looking at the same idea, these t statistics. The critical region then is also identical to the one sample t. We're looking at a not equal to case, so we're going to reject if the absolute value of our test statistic, because it could be on either side and a not equal to, is greater than the right-hand side, which is t. There'll be n minus 1 degrees of freedom, because we, we reduced it down to just the 20 difference numbers, okay? And alpha over 2, because we're looking at both sides. So again, that t comes from a t table. In our particular example, that value would be 19 degrees of freedom, since we had 20 drivers, and 0.025, and that value is 2.09. If we looked at it from a picture point of view, recall that we're splitting the alpha on both sides for the not equal to, so alpha over 2 on the left and right. And then the t value that cuts off that, the appropriate degrees of freedom, is what we're using as a critical value. Because it's symmetric, negative t alpha over 2 and positive t alpha over 2 are the same, 
So we simplify this by just absolute valuing our test statistic and looking at the positive side. Alternatively, because software typically reports p-values, we could simply find the p-value. Remember that the p-value is going to take the absolute value of the test statistic just to force it to be on the right-hand side of our curve up there. It's going to look at what the probability t is bigger than that. And then because we split the alpha in two on each side, then we're going to multiply by two so we can compare the p-value directly to alpha because we're only looking on one side. So there's a line there, the 0 0.7, 3.5, 1.8, so on. Those are the differences. So subtracting the 20 differences gives those numbers there. Okay. So the test statistic then is the average of those 20 numbers divided by the standard deviation of those 20 numbers over the square root of 20. So plugging all that in yields 2.29. Okay. So recall that the t value actually has a, is, has a meaning. It's not just a flat number, 2.29. It represents that basically our y bar diff uh, is 2.29 standard errors away from the target value of zero. Or in other words, the two means, okay, sample means are 2.29 standard errors apart from each other. Okay. That usually is fairly significant, anything outside of plus or minus two for a bell-shaped curve. The critical region recall that we just found on the previous slide was 2.09. So notice that our 2.29 does exceed we could also find the p-value. So we find the 2.29 on the table, on the t-table, on the t-curve with 19 degrees of freedom, right? Find that probability to the right, which is 0.068, oh, I'm sorry, 0.0168. And then we multiply that by 2, and we get 0.0336. That's the p-value. We could also calculate a confidence interval usually talking about a 95% confidence interval, is identical to the one sample t-test because as we said earlier, everything reduces down in this example. So it's y bar diff. Remember, confidence intervals are estimator plus or minus table value for confidence times uh, variation estimate. So we get y bar diff as our estimator. The t n minus 1, alpha over 2, or the same 2.09 from our critical region is the table value. And then our estimate of variation is s diff over the square root of n. So plugging all those same numbers in, we get a confidence interval of 0.017, say, or point, sorry, 0.17 to 3.76. So what this is saying is that we're 95% confident that the difference between those two averages it could be as little as 0.17 or as high as 3.76. Okay? These are probably in seconds, so that refers to seconds. We could check to see if this interval contains zero, because remember what we do with a confidence interval to relate it to a hypothesis test is we check if the target value is in the interval. You can see that zero in particular is not in the interval. So what's our conclusion? Well, since, since 2.29 is greater than 2.09, or the p-value of 0 0.0336 is less than 0 0.05, or the fact that mu diff equals zero is not in the confidence interval, we would reject the null hypothesis. Or we would have sufficient evidence, we could say that there's sufficient evidence to show that the true mean time, parking time, is lower for car B than it is for A. The reason for this is recall that the confidence interval was all positive and we did A minus B. So that means the A numbers are bigger than B. We actually want low numbers here, so therefore B is better. The assumptions would be the same as the one sample t-test. Random sample. And the differences, because we're only analyzing the differences, our assumptions on the differences, the differences follow a normal distribution. You can see that there's a probability plot. Most of the dots are following very close to the line, where the line represents the normal distribution. So you should feel fairly confident that normality is not a problem. It is important for the practitioner to understand 
that the appropriate analysis for this is a paired T test. Because as I mentioned earlier, it is easy to take the same data and dump it into a two sample T test in the software program. And the software program would easily go ahead and say, okay, I'll do a two sample T test if that's what you want to do. The p value, if you do that, the p value comes out to be 0 0.408. Notice how much larger that is than the p-value from the paired t-test, which is 0.0336. Okay? The reason for this is that the, the top of the t-statistic from a paired t-test and a two-sample t-test is identical. Okay? We're just talking about means and the linear functions, so they are identical. The difference between the two is the variation estimate in the bottom. Okay? The variation estimate in the paired t-test is removing that driver variation, right? We subtract it and just looking at the differences, so we remove the driver. The variation estimate in a two-sample t-test is looking at each column separately, which is, to say is looking at driver variation as well as car variation. So we're looking at those 18s and 40s and looking at that variation instead of subtracting the difference. So therefore, the variation estimate is typically much larger in a, a two-sample t-test than a paired. So you end up with this non-significant test using the two-sample and a significant test from paired. They will not always lead to opposite conclusions, but in this particular example, we get very different conclusions, okay, because the driver-to-driver -driver variability was very large. Again, the smaller driver-to-driver -driver variability is than the, the less difference you'll see between these two analysis approaches. But again, the way you collect